we're in Los Altos, which is my first time here, Sanjay. Great piece. It's a beautiful park here in uh, Lincoln Park. I, when you told me, let's uh, sit down and chat together, um, I wanted to pick a place which, uh, which was a nice park, a little bit of greenery, you get the surrounding traffic around you. Uh, I don't mean to be offensive, but Sanjay, you don't have a job. I could sponsor still if you want me to, <laughs> but you'll have to donate it to a charity. <laughs> yes, that, and that, that, that would be... Because I'm not uh, working for a company, but I'm happy to sponsor. I'll sponsor you anything you want to do. So yeah. I'm actually really enjoying this conversation, this opportunity for a conversation. A I think the last time we talked was on the Cuba, and I think I like this format better. I, I, I really like this format, and I think I'm going to like this topic a little bit better because we're going to talk about, I think, a little bit about career leadership and faith and you're very outward about your faith and you lead a very diverse community of people. What, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, you know, first off, um, I grew up in India and in India, 85% of the country is Hindu, 11% Muslim, um, and then the Sikh. Uh, Christians are about one or two percent. I'm one of those one or two percent. Wow. I tell people, if you've met a hundred Indians, and I'm I'm the I'm the one person you would have met who's likely this. Christian. My my key thing is is to really uh, I think you know whatever your faith is, it's how you treat people. Mm -hmm. And to me, the essence of my faith is you know living for a higher purpose that you know allows me to know that certainly my destiny is not just about VMware or about SAP. I've got an eternal destiny and I've got a plan, you know, and a purpose for my life that goes beyond just making a lot of money or having a career fulfilled. It's about the impact I could have on people, uh, starting first with my family because those are the ones that you're gonna have for your life, your wife, your children, and then the community you're in, it could be your neighborhood, it could be the community you interact with, including work, and then maybe a church or a place of worship. Um, and all of those places are an opportunity to have an impact. And um, when you do that, you're living. It's not about professing, you know, this. I do have a strong faith, and you'll find that I'm, I'm vocal about it, but I never want my faith to be a point of offensiveness to someone who is either Hindu or Muslim or, you know, an atheist. Uh, but I do want them to see in my actions that there's something different about this person. And the reason I'm different is not because I've gone through some self-improvement program. It's because I've got a deep faith to me and the person I worship is making me a better person every day. When you have to make the decision to cur curl the organization or let people go, how, does, how do you reconcile that with your faith? Wow, that's a tough one. Because that's one of the toughest decisions one ever has to make, whether it's you making it or people in your organization. Uh, Keith, I think, listen, whether you read the Sermon on the Mount or not, Matthew 5, 6, 7, in our good book, um, there's, you know, some pearls of wisdom. And I think even people are non-Christian. Mahatma Gandhi actually said Matthew 5, 6, and 7 were his favorite chapters of any book. Um, there's some passages in there that you can live your life with, like, you know, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would want done to yourself. So if you ask yourself, if you were the recipient of that call myself, mm -hmm. I've been laid off. Um, how would you want to treat people? And treat that person who is on the other end of it the same way you'd want to be treated. When you're hiring somebody, ask yourself, could you work for that person one day? Because you never know, sometimes the person you're hiring could become your boss one day. And you make very different. I, I remember this sort of statement from Warren Buffett, I'm going off Bible script now, but you know, I like the statement because it says when you look for people that he would hire, he looked for three qualities. Number one was their smarts, number two was their energy, and number three was their integrity. And if they had the first two, but didn't have the third, it would kill you. Mm. So I think looking at integrity is, shouldn't be just a Christian thing, it should be something of values. Now, I think you kind of are known by how you treat people, how you make decisions. Now, none of this means that you are this, you know, humble doormat. I mean, you know, the person we worship, Jesus was a humble person. He was the humblest person on earth. It doesn't mean that I'm, you know, I can't follow this person and not be competitive. I mean, you know, you know me pretty well because we work together. I want to win. I want to win every deal. I hate to you, lose. The, the, and the. I, I bring that passion <laughs> to work every day. But that's like when it's done, hey, we get off the field. 
and we could be friends with our competitors. It's not personal. I've seen you congratulate com competitors. Uh, Pat, when he went to Intel, congratulated the, the CEO of, of AMD. So I think, listen, you can be nice, play hard, uh, but it's how you treat people. And I think what, what we also have to remember is, this is, I came to this country as an immigrant. I was, by all American standards, poor, by Indian standards, probably middle class, lower middle class. So there's no way I could have afforded an education at Dartmouth. I was so fortunate to have a, a, a scholarship. So when I landed at Logan Airport in 1987, I knew nothing about the culture of this country. Never really seen snow before. It was cold. <laughs> but I will tell you that everything that I have been able to experience or receive, whether it was four years at Dartmouth, two years later at Harvard Business School, or now almost 30 years in the Silicon Valley, is a blessing. So when I look back at my roots and where I came from, I'm enormously grateful rather than arrogant. And I think what happens often when people accomplish more, I unfortunately see a lot more arrogance start to climb, and they start to treat people differently. Mm. And that's sad. And my hope and prayer for myself and the people around me, I say, listen, hold me accountable to the fact that if I'm successful, I would never smell of um, you know arrogance in the way I treat other people, and you should never forget your roots, um, you know, because that same person who came here um, at 17 years old who knew nothing is, in some senses, who I still am. I need to be intellectually curious. So I think those are all the principles by which you live by. I think the other parts that that to me are really rewarding and redeeming about my faith is how do you cha handle a crisis and challenge, right? prayer and reading the words of the deep part of my life but I know I can go to God in prayer I know that I can depend on someone who is my friend um, and even if the whole world lets me down mm. okay, I've got a friend right and that to me is that personal relationship um, you know with someone that you believe has kind of your back and has got an eternal plan for you uh, has helped me through the tough times um, I think that's kind of it. So it's almost day to day living by it. And then I would say the other thing that's really, you know, helped me, yeah, certainly the la more recently is, how do you live every day trying to be a blessing to one other person? You know, I've always believed it's mm. better to give than receive and the world's a happier place when you're a giver rather than a taker. And, you know, if there's some small way by which you can be a blessing to somebody else during that day, not because you're keeping tabs of it, but just because you want to give, um, I think the world's a happier place. And that person then says, hey, how can I repay you? It's like, listen, I don't need you to repay me. Turn that blessing to somebody else. So uh, to, uh, routinely, I'll be helping somebody in some fashion. It might be career advice, or maybe in some places, it's a philanthropic gesture. And I like to keep these, these you know, you know these, these the efforts anonymous. But at the end of it, someone will come to say, listen, that was so great, gracious of you to do this. Or, how can I repay you? Like, listen, I don't want you to repay me. I want you to turn around and do this to somebody else who's in need. So, you know, a, a lot of times, Sanjay, people can look at someone who's had your role, who's had your success. They can, you know, kind of ignore the fact that, you know, you are a poor immigrant and say, okay, now you're the man. And, you know, they can have a, a tendency of judging. I, I, I've, I've criticized VMware about the lack of diversity. You're a man in powerful positions, but even that, in that, you have your limits. You can't change societal issues. You can impact them, but you can't change them. How do you be sound, and even with the criticism that you know, that you know you're comfortable, that you've done what you can do? I mean, first by realizing that if someone's criticizing you, they may have a point. Mm -hmm. So I, I never want to be thick-skinned enough where, whether it's a peer, whether it's someone below you especially. Certainly people above you, you will listen to the criticism because they feel entitled to give you an opinion. But people below your peers may be intimidated as you go higher. You know. So if someone's criticizing me, I want to hear it. I mean, I actually want to hear all of my worst critiques uh, perspective on me because it's good to know that. And then if there's an element of truth to it, I need to work on that. Mm -hmm. So it's first a sense of, and you have to work on that harder the higher you go up because you start to believe your own, you know. Your own press, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's easy it, to do. It's easy to just kind of get lost in that thinking, oh, I'm great for X, Y, Z reason until someone pops a balloon. 
And I found that in my own experience, God pops my balloon whenever I think <laughs> I'm like up here and it's like, hey, I need to humble you down a little bit. So that's really good. And you know, there's a there's a great verse uh, uh, that I remember, First Peter five five. God gives grace to the humble, and He resists the proud. So I would say the first thing I want when people are critiquing or stuff is to listen, hear it, and see if there's an element of truth to it. If there isn't, if it's a completely false claim, and it's like you know, okay, I'm not going to react to it. Of course, if they're if they're um, criticizing my character and I'm completely innocent, I, I believe I will, I should stand up for asserting the fact that that's wrong. But then when it comes to the very complex topics you talked about, like how do you solve systemic racism in this country? Uh, I mean, both of us are people of color. Um, um, you've probably experienced it, I've experienced it, you grew up in this country, so maybe you experienced it more than I did, but I experienced it when I got here. And um, um, it may not be as much as in California, but in some parts of it is, there are parts of it here, but in other parts of the country it is. Can I solve that in society? No, I'm not called to be a Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, or a Mahatma Gandhi. Um, but I gotta make sure in SAP or VMware, where I was senior executives, there's no smell of that in my organization, and if I'm a leader in the company, in the whole company. Um, so if I sensed that there were elements of systemic racism, um, I wanted to be the ally of that that minority community you know whatever minority community it could have been african american hispanic or it could be any other minority community and i and i found myself necessarily attracted to the minority communities because i was an underdog myself at some point in time whether i was a christian in india at one point in time or a brown skin person here in the u.s um so i think that listen you when you take that mentality again coming back to do unto others as you want done to you um, you, 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 you pick your sphere of influence where you can have an influence on. Um, and you say, listen, that is the sphere that I have been called to try and have an impact on. And for me, it was, it certainly started with my family, then the community uh, I work in, and to the extent that I, and then if there were parts which I did not know how to solve or, you know, I was very comfortable asking other people, like, what are your advice, whether it's within the company or other peers of mine in the industry. I, I have a very large Rolodex of friends and executives in the industry. I'd ask them routinely, how did you handle the situation? Could be a quick phone call. And I love learning from community speak of experts, mm -hmm. uh, where from the council of, uh, you know, many, there's often wisdom. And um, that's that certainly helped me. But I will fully admit that I'm still making mistakes. and. You know, when you have that sort of sense of, you know, growth mindset, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. There's willingness in these areas where it's not all black and white. How do you navigate the gray um, and still make sure that you're making the world a better place, whether it's the company you're working, your family or your community? Well, Sanjay, I really appreciate you taking the time out. Uh, this has been Sanjay Poonin, unfiltered, no AR, no PR, no marketing just two christians getting together in a park in a beautiful part of the conversation talking about family life career what's next and hopefully it'll, it'll be somewhere where you can uh, where are we going to do the next one uh, chicago the, you know uh chicago let's not do it if we do it in chicago let's just make sure it's not cold <laughs> because i'm not even going to be in chicago the, the spring and the cold. summer in chicago are beautiful beautiful Maybe right on the lake i don't know i can imagine a picturesque There's, spot plenty of places to that I can take you to Chicago has well plenty of Keith let me just say a, 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 a sentence or two because you've been very kind I've really appreciated and for all of the viewers there your authenticity you're authentic you are you're a you're, you're very smart I mean that's that's and all of the stuff the blogs you put out and the things that you track the industry whenever you interview with me the questions were smart but also your dialogue your blogs were but you're authentic and that's that's rare in this industry. Keep it going. I wish you all the best in your wife. I like the fact that you're doing these, uh, you know, 13 city tours. Uh, I have a small little idea. I was thinking of taking my kids to go to all the different baseball games in these various different cities. Oh, so maybe that's that the next thing we do together. That would be awesome to, to, to uh, and, uh, I'm assuming you're a Giants fan. I'm Look a Sox fan. And uh, World White, Series, Sox, White, White Sox fan. <laughs> I mean, we have ours in 2005. We'll, maybe the next time we get together, it will be a, a, a Giants and a that would be great. Sox Wolf Series. Thank you so much. You want to learn more about the CTO Advisor, you can follow me on the web at CTO Advisor. It's the Twitter, Twitter handle, thectoadvisor.com forward slash road dash trip to find out where we've gone, where we'll be. Talk to you next CTO Dose.